Hello, you are listening to an archived worship service of First Presbyterian Church, Columbus, Mississippi. Thank you for listening. I was reminded of a famous quote this last week. The quote goes something like this. Believe none of what you hear and only half of what you see. Believe none of what you hear and only half of what you see. Now, you might be thinking that this quote is attributed to a guy named Thomas, the patron saint of doubt. And that would be a good guess, but this is actually a quote from, does anybody know? Benjamin Franklin, the patron saint of Philadelphia, I guess. I don't know, his statue's everywhere in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, this beautiful city where I spent most of last week. I got to walk around and see the tulips in bloom. I got to walk up to the Liberty Bell or as close as the security guard would let me. It was a beautiful, beautiful city. They love Benjamin Franklin. This quote was apropos, as I found myself in Philadelphia for a reason, not for vacation or to be a tourist. I found myself there in meetings in meetings not just for the church, but a particular branch of the church called the Board of Pensions. All right, it is that much fun. Yes, as fun as it sounds. This was the Regional Benefits Conference of the Board of Pensions. It's held annually. Oh, this is a meeting of numbers, a meeting of graphs, a meeting of doubts and of trust. Now, the Board of Pensions oversees, well, what it says. Our pension fund for ministers also oversees medical and life insurance, and it partners with Fidelity. I know my eyes are glazing over, too. So that's what they do. And we get together once a year for us to hear what's going on, and I represented our presbytery this last year. As I see it, their job was to make people feel safe, even when they have to end every conversation they have with uh, with a line that goes something like this. Past returns do not guarantee future earnings. I'm sure you've heard that from somewhere in your life, a financial broker or someone has told you that or seen it on TV. That does not really bode well for feeling safe. It only adds to the doubt that goes around the room. Now, the skepticism of Franklin would cry out, hey, nothing's safe. You can't believe your own ears, and you can only believe your eyes half the time. And if nothing is safe, then doubt must always accompany us. I guess that is why they have these events every year, to alleviate just a little bit of doubt by showing people that the the ministers that they have been safe at least financially over the past year and tell people hey we've been doing this for almost 200 years there's been some trust even through the doubt now we have learned all of us some the hard way that doubt is necessary without it we will fall for just about anything Have you ever gotten the phone call that sounds just a little bit suspicious from the IRS or from that that wonderful agency that just needs $10 a month, but you've somehow never heard of them? (coughs) Or what about the foreign prince that has picked you to give his millions to? All he needs is your checking account number. Or my favorite is Bill Gates. Every now and then, he puts a picture on Facebook, and if I like it, he'll pay off all of my student loans. Man, what a nice guy. Well, I doubt it. I doubt that's true. We are, in many ways that are good and healthy, doubters. It was a phrase I got used to hearing in seminary, although it really isn't a seminary phrase. I should have learned it much earlier in life, honestly. But it uses really big words, and I think that's why it gets associated sometimes with seminary. The phrase is hermeneutic of suspicion. 
What that means is add doubt. Be suspicious in what you learn, in what you've heard, in what you trust, and ultimately what you believe. A hermeneutic of suspicion. Examine, look through, look behind, look into carefully, and ask what words are not being said when somebody talks because those words not said might be really important. Or to look for what's not being shown because what's not being shown is probably just as important as what is being shown. That is to add into your observation in what you take in at least a little bit of suspicion. Now we are taught by this world to cultivate and carefully study, to add in the practices of judgment. And doubt is a powerful tool in our arsenal. Without it, we're left open to all sorts of shenanigans. One should have some hermeneutic of suspicion. But that's all it is, a tool. It's a filter, it's a lens, and it's certainly not all we have. It's not all we possess. We also have this thing called trust. And trust is every bit as useful or powerful and necessary. And even without trust, we cannot have things like the Board of Pensions. And I bet you Benjamin Franklin at least had a little bit of trust. Applied to John's Gospel today, and we are hearing them tell why he puts this together. It is at the very end of John's Gospel, before the prologue, the epilogue, which we, we talked about last week, is at the end of chapter 20 that John tells us why he writes his Gospel. Did you hear it? It's at that very end where the writer's voice comes through, right after Jesus' last quote. The writer comes through and says, Hey, there are many other stories. There are many other things that happen. Here's why I wrote this down. I wrote this down so that you may have faith. Now many other stories are out there. Many others could have been added. Many others were considered. But these are here written down for you today in this gospel for the purpose of faith. And a faith that leads to life. Now Luke, on the other hand, the only other gospel writer that gives us a reason, says that he is telling us this from the very beginning. This is in chapter 1. I made up my mind to carry out a careful investigation of all things from beginning and write them in an orderly account so that you might have in your mind a full and reasonable account. It sounds to me like Luke would have been perfect on the Board of Pensions. He knows exact language. He's giving orderly account. He probably could even put us some bar graphs and add some numbers to it. Luke is writing to dispel doubt, but John is writing to inspire faith. These are two powerful tools and both needed. Now I asked Russell to play this anthem this morning. I asked him to learn it a few weeks ago and I'm thankful that he shared his, his talent with us this morning. I heard this song many years ago. It is a song of honest doubt. Something that we don't hear a lot of. It's a promise made, a promise broken, and a promise taken. It's a voice that seems to ponder death, but if you listen to the lyrics, in reality it is all about life. One that accepts failings and also accepts forgiveness. It was Tennyson that once wrote, There lives more faith in honest doubt, believe me, than in half the creeds. In honest doubt. 
So we hear in that song by Nickel Creek this morning, and it's what we glimpse in Thomas. This truth was spoken to over and over again by our elders and our deacons this, this last week as they came before the session. They were each asked to prepare a faith statement, and each of them gave some account of this need to be honest. This place where they don't feel qualified, or maybe that they have felt some kind of insecurity in their faith. The same thing that led each of you to raise your hand a moment ago when we asked for the children. How many of you have seen yourself in those honest moments of doubt? How many of us are given space to voice them? I believe that is why John adds these words and feels them necessary to include this story in his account. It is an honest doubt. An honest doubt is part of a living faith. John says that his goal, his aim for writing this is to cultivate faith and what can bloom in its presence. But ultimately, he looks for us to find life. And life in a faith is not one that is dead. And it's not one that's closed. And that means there will always, always, always be some measure of doubt built in. Like our songwriter says, Thomas' voice is an honest doubt. And it is in his toolbox, and he's going to use it. And I want us to notice two things this morning that happen when he does. Thomas voices his doubt before his friends, and two really important things happen here that I think we need to learn in our living faith, especially as we live in the life of this church. First, Thomas stays. He doesn't leave the others. He doesn't leave because he's not the same as the others. They believe he doubts. But you know what? The community can bear it. The community can bear it. And the second thing that I want you to see is the others let him stay. They could have drawn a line in the sand and given him an or else statement. They could have demanded an apology because basically he's calling them all liars to their face. But they didn't. They didn't. Christ gave them responsibility for retaining sin or forgiving. You know what they did? They forgave. Thomas was welcome, even in his doubt. Trust and doubt. Both are part of faith. Both are part of this community. Both are always part of the church, our worship, and our life together with God. That is real life. The Scottish minister William Barclay says, John's gospel was not written to give us information, but to give life. It was to paint such a picture of Jesus that the reader would be bound to see that the person who could speak and teach and act and heal like this could be none other than the Son of God. And that in that belief, one might find the secret of real life. The week goes by, it's a week later, and Jesus proves His parables true. Even one sheep will be salt. Everyone, even in the midst of a crowd. The honest doubt of Thomas in this community and in Christ's presence is released then to trust. And he exclaims, my Lord and my God, the greatest of all claims of Jesus in the gospel. He's the first to call Christ God. Christ gives him the last beatitude. Did you hear it? Blessed, or maybe even better, it's happy 
are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Doubt is ever in our toolbox, but it will never lead us to happiness. And it never leads to life. Doubt by itself finds nothing in life, only fear, and ultimately, when left alone, unattended, it leads to complete isolation. Now Franklin may have spoken a lot about doubt, but he dreamed of a new way to achieve liberty. And the Board of Pensions may point to almost 200 years of gathering together to demonstrate that fear is not our first instinct. But John gives us a glimpse of an honest doubt and its power in the community of faith to blossom into the greatest of all faiths, my Lord and my God. John says, I write this to you that you may have faith, and we hear it this day so that we might as well. Christ will seek you out. Even in those places you feel isolated and alone, even in those deepest circles of doubt, may Christ always seek you out. That you might have life, real life, and have it eternally. Amen.